Hello everybody. If I've done my job correctly, over the last few years, many of you will probably feel as if you've gotten to know me fairly well. And I'd like to think that I know you too. So, that being said, I'm pretty sure we can all agree that there's nothing better than a good story about a bad car. And boy, have I got the tale for you today. So, break out the popcorn, get the Earl Grey on the go. This is going to be a good one. On the face of it, what we have here today is your average, ordinary, everyday Austin Maestro. A car that I'm sure will divide opinion, but it's also one that I'm entirely indifferent about. Because, by the time I was a teenager, they were essentially gone. However, this is no average, ordinary, everyday Austin Maestro, and the story of how it came to be reads like a Jean Le Carré novel. The Maestro is a small hatchback in the same class as a Golf. It was introduced by British Leyland in 1982 and, thanks to a new corporate strategy, actually replaced two of their models, the Maxi and the Allegro, the latter of which I've actually sampled and though in its day it wasn't particularly well loved, I actually quite enjoyed it. This however is a very different car. In place of the very trick hydrogas suspension in the Allegro, this has conventional items, McPherson strut up front and a torsion beam at the rear, which was equivalent to the Golf back then. Though it received a fairly warm reception from the press, early cars suffered build quality issues and Austin never had the best image. As a result, the car failed to sell in the numbers the British Leyland had hoped. Come the end of the 1980s and the Maestro was looking a little long in the tooth. Its official replacement arrived in the form of the Rover 200. However, the Maestro remained on sale, instead positioned now as a more budget item. It was only in 1994, after 12 years of production, that Maestro sales were officially stopped. However, the car's story does not end there. A plan was hatched to sell these cars in complete knockdown form to a company in Bulgaria called Rodokar, who would then assemble and sell them locally as a Bulgarian-made vehicle at a low price point. However, things didn't go quite so well. Though a number of kits were sent over and some assembled, very early on the deal was axed. So, we had a whole bunch of kits here, unsold, a whole bunch of cars in Bulgaria without owners, and no one quite knew what to do. Happily, there were two companies here in Britain that could see a future for the good old Maestro. The first was a company called Parkway, based in a town called Ledbury. They bought the stockpile of some 600 kits that had never been sent over to Bulgaria and finished them off. These are not classified as an Austin or Rover product, instead they are officially kit cars and today are known as the Ledbury Maestros. This is not one of those. This is one of the vehicles which was exported to Bulgaria, assembled there but never retailed. A British company then re-imported them and they were sold on by a firm called Apple 2000 based out of Bury St Edmunds, where I grew up and went to school. They were under no illusions that what they had on their hands was a very old car just with no miles on it. And in fact, the advertising campaign for them was based on the fact that's exactly what it was. You could still buy one of these, an Austin Maestro, new in 2001 for the princely sum of £4,299. When it comes to anything British Leyland, I will confess I am generally fairly clueless. If you want somebody that knows what they're talking about, I highly recommend Steph from iDriver Classic, Ian from Hubnut, or Matt from Furious Driving, who coincidentally has also featured this exact car. What can I tell you though? Well, I believe all the Bulgarian market cars were made to the same specification, based on our Clubman trim, but without the sunroof. Up front, you will find a 1275cc A-series engine, as seen in things like the Mini. It produces here 68 horsepower and is mated to a five-speed gearbox from a Volkswagen van. You also got the suspension from the diesel model and very little in the way of creature comforts. There are disc brakes at the front, drums at the rear, windy windows all round, and as with any old car, you have a selection of about seven different keys. There is no power steering and it has about 50 turns from lock to lock. It was sold new in 1999, written off in the early 2000s, then for the majority of its life, some 16 years, owned by a painter decorator as his work vehicle. So if you were being polite to it, you'd say it was heavily patinated. If you were being more direct about it, you might say what it says on the number plate. It now belongs to a lovely chap called William, who bought it earlier in the year when he went to go and get an alloy wheel refurbished, saw it, and then wound up purchasing it. I think we can all relate. The aim for this car is to essentially bring it back to good condition and simply enjoy it in the summer months. He works on the car himself and says that generally speaking, parts are cheap, provided you can find them. They're not quite as plentiful as I expected. 
In spite of its rustic aesthetic, he assures me that mechanically, it's actually quite good. So, let's take it out for a drive. It's funny, isn't it, how time can change your perspective, sometimes quite dramatically. As a young man, I wouldn't want to be seen dead in one of these, and were my parents to buy one, I almost certainly would have divorced them. However, for myself, and I'm sure many others, the moment I turned 17, my standards immediately dropped, because I was determined to get out there, no matter what it was behind the wheel of. Today, just seeing something like this brings a real smile to my face. I love every time I see a classic on the road because there is a real live piece of history out about being used and enjoyed rather than tucked away in a glass case. To me, cars like this offer a real tangible connection to the past in a way that very little else can truly replicate. However, as you might imagine, for a car that is a 23-year example of a 40-year-old design, there are a few things about it that are non-standard. Some of them are very much run-of-the-mill items, like the fact it now has a modern stereo in it, the aftermarket alarm system, which actually works, the headlining is on holiday, the aforementioned heavily patinated paintwork, and stuff like the radiator, which is not the original item, instead one from an earlier maestro, because that was all William could find. Some items are slightly more unusual and concerning, like, for example, the large amount of orange tape covering up some of the worst sections of corrosion. That, I am happy to tell you, is being tended to fairly soon. The car will shortly be coming off the road and over winter a number of restoration items done. William is very hands-on with this car and it's a point of pride that though it is somewhat a work in progress, it actually runs and drives well. That little A-series fires into life almost immediately. There is a manual choke down here, though on days like today you really don't need it. One item that's certainly not standard is the Mad Max style side exit exhaust, which looks rather mean but actually sounds very sedate. That was something of a necessity because before that this car had a very cheap pattern part fitted and that exited in the conventional place at the rear but was fitted in such a way that every time you had a passenger in the back it was constantly contacting the bodywork or the underside of the car and would often work its way entirely loose. So you'd be driving along and then your exhaust would decide it wanted to have a five minute break. So then, as we're now approaching one of my favourite sections of road, let's find out what the good people of Bulgaria are missing out on. I might have to mention to William that a clutch could need to go on his resto list. Up the hill there, the revs began to rise, but the speed did not. Truth be told, you do need to work this car reasonably hard if you want to keep up with modern day traffic. Thanks to that 5-speed gearbox coming from a van, the ratios are actually quite short, so keeping the engine on the boil is actually fairly easy. As it happens, the A-Series is a fairly interesting thing. It is a very old design, can trace its roots all the way back to the 1950s, so even in the 80s it was no spring chicken. Plans were already afoot for British Leyland to replace this engine wholesale back in the 1970s. However, when tested with its modern rivals, it was found it still compared favourably in terms of low-end torque and fuel economy. As the world was still reeling from an oil crisis, and I think we can all relate to that now, it was decided that actually an economical and torquey engine was probably the best thing. So, £30 million was spent in upgrading it and refining it to turn it into the A+, which is what this has. It is also worth remembering that this isn't perhaps quite as outlandish as it may seem, because back in 2000, you could also still buy a brand new old Mini. One thing I also discovered while doing my research is that Nissan actually bought the rights to the A-Series, turned it into what they called the E-Series, I think. Of course, a lot of work was done to bring it up to Nissan's standards. However, it had a fairly long and happy life, eventually winding up as the 170 horsepower CA18 DET, as seen in things like the old Sylvia. So, engine aside, the gearbox itself is actually fairly pleasant. All the pedals are pretty light. The brakes are servo-assisted, which I wasn't expecting, though the steering is manual. The handbrake, I have been forewarned, does not work, and that is accurate information. The instrument binnacle, I must say, I have a real affinity for, though the dash above it is trying to make a break for it. The turning circle is actually very good, though the look required to achieve it is hilarious. 
The reason I'm quite so fond of this instrument display is not just because of its elegant simplicity, but the fact that when I was a child, my grandfather actually gave me a part of an old British Leyland Dash to play with. I don't believe it was quite the same as this, but is very close because I do recognize it. I think I've got it in my garage still, so I'll put a picture up of what I'm talking about. As you might imagine, it does roll a fair bit. Ride comfort is very good, despite the fact this moved to the conventional suspension from the old Hydrogas and actually works fairly well. One oddity of this gearbox is that when you go from third to fourth, it doesn't feel like you're doing that. It feels like you're doing that. Actually, that's not very helpful for you. All right, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like doing that. So you feel when you're going from third to fourth, like you're actually being diverted over into second. That's very disconcerting the first time you do it. You're also constantly going for a non-existent sixth or seventh gear because you'll drive along like myself, go, oh, this is revving a little bit, I'll change up. Oh, I was in fifth already. Okay, all right, fair enough. I'll just uh, carry on then. The steering's a real oddball. There is quite a bit of movement in it with very little feedback, but once you do get it turned in and the car waits up, it's actually quite nice, quite interactive, and does give you an idea as to what the chassis is doing, which is never really all that much because I think press on even remotely hard and this car will just lay down and roll over. Not literally, I hope, but it's not exactly sporty. There were sportier versions of the Maestro, including the fairly cool and mean looking MG Maestro Turbo, which I would love a go in, because I reckon that's quite a thing. Could be awful, but I don't know until I've tried it. Possibly obvious, but also worth mentioning, it is front engine, front wheel drive. This was still something of a novelty back then, though front wheel drive itself was hardly a new invention. Citroen had been doing it in the 1930s, but for mass market cars, it was still fairly recent. In the 1970s, your default car was still front engine, rear wheel drive, but it was that decade that really saw economy cars move over to front front. The seats are actually pretty decent, of course, very little in the way of support, but it also doesn't need them. They are, however, comfy springy, and there's quite a bit of room in here too. You really can get four adults and a shockingly large amount of stuff in the boot. The trade-off for that is that in the event of an accident, it's not exactly a Saab, but I think people in the 1980s knew what they were signing up for. People in the 2000s, maybe not so much. I'm actually really quite impressed with this car. It drives nicely, hasn't coughed or spluttered once, and it's been a real joy. I wouldn't want to take this anywhere near a motorway, that frankly would be quite terrifying, but if your daily commute is this kind of stuff, 50, 60 mile an hour B roads, then it's a very, very pleasant car. It's actually reasonably well insulated, wind and road noise, not that bad at all. Parts when you can find them are quite cheap and happily not everything is difficult to get, though some bits are. Of course, just about everything about the interior of this car doesn't scream luxury, but that's the whole point of it. It was built as a cheap car in the 1980s, was a really cheap car in the 1990s, and then by the 2000s, well, they're practically giving them away. 4,000 quid wouldn't have got you a lot even then. The closest modern day equivalent really would be something like a Dacia, because though they have put some effort into disguising it, a lot of that range is actually reheated, rather old Renaults. But then, there's nothing wrong with that if you're looking to buy a very cheap car. Like just about everything, these are no longer the cut price bargain that they were. The days of being able to pick a car like this up for 50 or 100 quid are very much long gone. Now you're looking at at least many hundreds of pounds, if not thousands, for a car which has had a lot of work done. I'm talking there about the Maestro in general, rather than the reasonably rare Apple 2000 example, though I do have something of an affinity for this on account of the Berry St. Edmunds connection. To get into one of these cars now, I would say you do require some sort of love for it. It's not the sort of thing I could recommend someone buy just on a whim, like William did, but for those who are willing to put up with what it is, I would actually say this is probably a fairly easy classic to live with. And it's one that I'm very happy to say I have now experienced and quite enjoyed. I suppose the best thing you could say for it is that now, as when new, it does offer an interesting alternative at a lower price to a VW Golf, which now may actually wind up being the easier and cheaper car to maintain. So then, that's a drive in an Austin Maestro Apple 2000. A huge thank you to William for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.